So today, I get this fun task, we can skip by this, um, of talking about what I call finding your glucose balance. I think a lot of us find balance in our life or we're striving for it, right? You want to balance your home life with work life and we outwardly do things to take care of our health, our body, our world, and that includes so many things. We're always talking about balance. I need balance in my life. Probably what we don't think enough about is balance inside. Honestly, it sounds kind of tedious, but biochemically finding balance. And glucose, glucose is the most common carbohydrate currency in your bloodstream. It's, what, it's like a dollar bill. It's floating around, and it's the currency that your cell uses for fuel. It also uses fat as fuel and a little bit of protein as fuel. But it is the currency that your cells are using. And we want to, as we'll learn, regulate, manage. We need to manage that glucose balance. So I'm going to start with some bad news because I want us to all be motivated to tell a story to help your world, to help your people understand what is going on with glucose balance worldwide, in your community as well. What's going wrong? What's this diabetes business that everybody's talking about? Insulin resistance, have you heard that? Okay, well, we're gonna learn all about it. I want you to be able to translate this to people so that they can understand. So the, the not so great news is we're in a health crisis. I know that's not news to you. We hear about heart disease, and I um, know that many other chronic health conditions besides heart disease, cancer, and the list goes on and on that impact us, especially as we get older. And we want our youth to be healthy. We want them to grow into their lives without being faced with these challenges. But let's face it, the statistics are not encouraging. So I'm gonna pick one, the disease of diabetes. And worldwide, we're looking at well over 400 million people. And these are statistics from 2014. I'll show you a chart, trust me, it's, it's gone up. We know that here in the U.S., 10% roughly of the population has been diagnosed with diabetes. I haven't told you yet, it, yet what it is, and I know you have a thought what diabetes is, but <clears throat> we're going to tell a story, so I think you'll be able to hold on to it better and be able to describe it. The, to me, the real telling thing is that 37% of the population in the U.S., is what we call pre-diabetic. They're hedging that way. Now, you might think, well, so what's the big deal? So diabetes. Well, as soon as we have our story and you learn why, essentially, an imbalance, so we've lost our balance in blood glucose, why is that so detrimental to us? Why is that unhealthy? Well. If you look at the number up there that over $800 billion, and the, we basically in the U.S. grab a third of that amount of money spending in health care costs, how could elevated blood sugar, blood glucose, cause so many problems? We're going to learn about it, because I think you need to convince people you're talking about. And it's, trust me, it's not a hard sell. It's not a political sell, <laughs> by any means. We're, we're going to share the facts. So if you understand the facts, then you'll be able to show people this is why you want to manage your blood glucose. This is why we want to be in, in control. So if we go back to that little bullet point about diabetes and prediabetes, let's add roughly 10% to 37%. And what do we get? 40, almost half. You guys are way smarter than college students. So, <laughs> You get that, and we say, whoa, this is very meaningful. There's a good half of the population that either has this disease <clears throat> or is heading towards it. Now, I want to show you this graph, teeny lines, teeny numbers, but what we're showing is from 1980 and move forward about 35 years, just plotting statistics around the world 
in Africa, in the Mediterranean region, in the US. The black dotted line is the rate worldwide. What overall trend do you see? Upward trend. Now, if that was your savings account, you'd be really happy, right? I would be. Just interest alone. Well, this is not positive. This is showing that year after year after year, we're seeing an increase rise with no signs of slowing down, and in some countries, quite a bit faster. I feel very scared. Because with high blood glucose progressing to the disease of diabetes, if more people are pre-diabetic, and a lot of them don't know they have it, we're walking around with elevated, and I'll show you, elevated blood glucose levels, and this causes damage. This causes damage to your eyesight, to your circulation, to your heart, to your kidneys, and, and we're all getting older, the beats the alternative, we're moving along, which is great. But what they're considering now, type 3 diabetes, is Alzheimer's. Why? Because we note that people with Alzheimer's also have insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes. So why is that so important? I'm, we're going to look at that. You're going to have a really good answer for everybody. Why is this so bad? That just because your blood sugar levels are high, it literally compromises your overall body health. So we're going to start with our story, okay? So take notes, we're in class, okay? Little test later, not really. Uh, Josh told me I couldn't do that. <laughs> what I want to show you is to help us understand when we talk about blood glucose response. On the y-axis is just units of blood glucose. And on the x-axis, going across the bottom, is time. So if we start at time zero, we see what we call fasting blood glucose. So if you hadn't eaten for several hours, your blood glucose, if it's in the healthy range, um, would be just a tad below 100, in between 80 and just below 100. That's normal, healthy, fasting blood glucose. Now, I give you something to eat. I give you something to eat to eat that has literally any carbohydrate. I could give you a bowl of quinoa. I could give you some beans. I could give you corn, white bread, wheat bread, fruit. Makes no difference what the carbohydrate is. It will eventually make it to glucose in your bloodstream. That's the common currency. Your body spends dollar bills, spends glucose. That's what it ends up doing and modifying. If, you, if I were to feed you a piece of fruit that has a lot of fructose in it. It ends up eventually as, fructo as fructose being converted to glucose. So this is just a generic curve. So I give you a bowl of quinoa, or I give you just pure carbohydrate, and I see a rise in your blood glucose level. And as that rises, it sends off a signal. It tells your organ called the pancreas, hey, I got some fuel coming in. We need to process this. It needs to get to my cells that absolutely need it for fuel. Glucose is not bad. Your brain literally only functions on glucose. You got to have it. Your muscle cells, all sorts of cells in your body. Insulin's released, and I'll, I'll introduce you to insulin in a moment so we can get a good look at what insulin is like. Insulin literally goes around to all the cells, knocks on the doors, and says, hey, I have glucose out here. You need it, right? Door opens up, glucose goes in. Blood glucose levels fall down to normal, okay, and the healthy range. So what are we talking about when someone has abnormal handling, unhealthy, you're out of balance? Well, for starters, you have more glucose in your bloodstream to begin with. And we'll see, not good, not good at all. And many people, like I said in the beginning, don't know that they have it. So we give this load of, of carbohydrate, they eat the bowl of quinoa, they have or a couple slices of bread or whatever it might be, and their glycemic response, you've probably heard that term before, you see a rise in blood glucose level, but but guess what? It started out high, and now it's even getting higher. 
Why? Because when insulin is released and it tries to signal the cells, hey, I've got some fuel out here, your cells aren't listening. They're resistant to insulin, right? And that, over time, gets classified if it progresses and you hit certain numbers. This is a time when a high score is not good, when your blood sugar levels are high, that you end up being diagnosed with type 2. So let's meet insulin. I bet you've never seen them before. <laughs> this is insulin. I want you to think of your body and all the blood vessels and all the cells as this fabulously busy elementary school, all right? And insulin is the hall room monitor. And the only way students, glucose, can get into the cells is if insulin, the hall room monitor, knocks on the door and says, I have students that need to get into your muscle cell classroom to your eyeball cell classroom. So insulin is in charge of signaling the body throughout the body to let it know that, hey, I've, this is a normal process, that, hey, glucose is out here, and it is instrumental. It's one of the main touch points. I'm going to use the word touch points or phrase quite a bit because I want you to be able to explain what the glucose management touch points are when we look at the whole system. So let's see insulin at work. You've just eaten your quinoa, your beans, white bread, wheat bread, and you have the student's glucose out into the bloodstream. Insulin notices it, gets released from the pancreas, goes around, knocks on cell, cell doors, receptors, cell receptors that are listening for insulin, and what ends up happening is the receptor responds, glucose gets into the cell. Good. It gets used for fuel. It might get stored as a storage form of carbohydrate called glycogen. Has anybody heard of glycogen before? Stored in the liver, stored in the muscle. Much more overall in your body in the muscle. If I added up all your storage of glucose in your body, you have a loaf of bread's worth, a loaf of bread equivalent. If you're super fit, you have a little bit more. Okay, so we do need that ability because is there a certain part of your body that absolutely has to have glucose for fuel? What? Okay, good. You guys were listening. You must have had some <laughs> glucose earlier. All right, so let's go back then and we look at this. Okay, so now does this make sense? We released insulin after a carbohydrate load, blood levels go up, knock on the door because the pancreas releases insulin, it goes into the cell, we bring it back down. That's a healthy response. Things can go wrong, though. Unfortunately, things can go wrong. And some people, sometimes at a very early age, age 5, 7, 12, due to an illness, an autoimmune illness, genetics, their pancreas doesn't make insulin. It just doesn't get made. And the symptoms are devastating, has to be caught pretty soon, because Who's not getting the fuel that they need? Your whole body, literally. You don't have the insulin to let the cells know that you have energy outside. Now, notice there's no insulin. Who's accumulating in the hallways of this busy school? Glucose, I might add, unattended. Okay, keep that, keep that in mind. This glucose is unattended, just hanging out. Okay, this is type 1 diabetes, okay? This is type 1. 1 in 10 people in the U.S. with diabetes have this form. So it's not the most common form. Let's see what's going on with the other form of diabetes. Over time, and let's just talk genetics, diet, lifestyle, poor intake of certain compounds in your diet, your insulin doesn't work as well. The receptors are not hearing insulin knocking. It's being released. Glucose is out there waiting to get into cells, but it's not being heard. The door is almost like ironclad. It's just not busting in. The insulin's not, not working. So what does the pancreas do? Send out more insulin. It's going to send out more insulin 
but the glucose is not getting in. Here's the trick, though. Your body thinks it's starving because the cells aren't getting the fuel that they need. So what kind of message do you think that brings to the brain? Eat more. And you get more glucose in your bloodstream. And you have a vicious cycle. Because the more you eat, the more calories you take in. They do eventually get converted to fat, and the fat cells get bigger, and this makes matters worse. So this is, is not good. When you have insulin resistance, when the cell's not responding and the insulin's not working, and this is a touch point, insulin knocking on the door. How well is that receptor hearing? How well is that insulin working? And almost also, how much insulin is, is being sent out? So this becomes a strain on the pancreas. It can develop into type 2 diabetes. Okay, so that's the, that's the difference. Do you see the difference? Now, some people can develop type 2 diabetes and eventually their pancreas gives up and doesn't make any more insulin and they have to take insulin replacement. But they didn't start out as a type 1 diabetic. All right, so let's go back to, okay, so what's the big deal? So we have a lot of glucose students hanging out in the blood vessels throughout your body. I said these glucose units, the little green balls here, looking kind of disappointed that they're not getting to where they're going. What do you think happens when you leave students unattended in hallways? <laughs> Anything? Trouble. Trouble is right, and that's what happens with glucose. The glucose goes, goes crazy. Literally spray painting the walls, ripping off the wallpaper, damaging, damaging your blood vessels. For starters, people with both type 1 and type 2 diabetes and pre-diabetes have an elevated risk for vascular disease. Why? The glucose is damaging the artery walls, the blood vessel walls. Does that make sense now? Why this happens? Okay, then because you have poor circulation, because these blood vessels are getting irritated, they actually accelerate the development of vascular damage, cardiovascular disease, the buildup of cholesterol plaque uh, in the linings, that you can lose your eyesight. Blood vessels grow into the eyes. So the leading cause of eyesight loss or blindness has to do with that related to insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. And sadly, what else happens is that people develop a series of infections that don't clear up. They get a sore on their foot, there's poor circulation. What's high in the blood now with sugar? So if you have bacteria, it loves it. You have urinary tract infections because the bacteria love the urine glucose that you're spilling. So that's why it happens. So having elevated blood glucose is what? Trouble. It's just not good. We want to, way back, try to slow this progression to keep insulin, these touch points to keep insulin working. So if we look at, I'm sorry to disappoint you, there isn't that little character insulin <laughs> in your bloodstream, though I was liking him. Uh, this is what is, we're looking at if, if you could take a snapshot of a small capillary flowing by a body cell, Glucose needs to be in contact with the insulin, and this is going to go to the receptor and delivered to the cell. These are touch points. These are touch points. We always talk about, oh, avoid sugar or do this so you don't elevate your blood sugar level. We have lots of different management touch points inside of you. And the SAB, the Scientific Advisory Board, has long known this. I can't take credit for it. I'm only... I'm a newbie, but they've long known about the importance of glycemic control. Fancy word, but it simply means the ups and the downs of your blood sugar regulation. So now if I go back to the normal curve, can you explain this to someone? Do you think you can take this simple diagram? The numbers for you to remember, and I'm going to show you a chart, might become important if people ask you specific questions. Of course, we're not talking about treating a disease here. 
What I want to explain is how can we all better manage for healthy people? How can we better manage our blood glucose? How can we better manage and halt the progression that all of us seem to be headed for? Remember the trend, and we want to end the trend. So when we look at the development of type 2 diabetes, can you explain this? That the insulin is knocking and nobody's listening for a variety of reasons. There are quite a few reasons this happens, and we're going to talk a little bit about those. So let's look at numbers. I think it's helpful because if anybody in this room has gone in for a typical physical and they've said, oh, I need to get a fasting blood glucose on you, then you would find out your number that it should be below 100. Now, it shouldn't be 60. You'd probably pass out at, in the doctor's office. So it, we do a really good job. Why do you think we can't just let our blood glucose levels go down to zero? You know the answer to this. Your brain, you would pass, and that's why people do, if they suddenly have a drop in blood. If I were to shoot insulin, and I could shoot insulin in your veins, in your body, it would send all your glucose into cells and you would pass out. It would be very serious. It wouldn't be something you'd want to have done to you. When I give you what's called an oral glucose tolerance test, fancy, okay, don't worry about it. All I'm doing is giving you that big old bowl of quinoa or something that's carbohydrate. I see it go up and it doesn't get much past 140. That's healthy. If you have this test done and, and you don't know, you don't, guess what? Do you think you can feel that your blood sugar level is 110, 120? No, silent. That's why so many people go around not knowing that they are, ooh, they're edging up. And guess what? We are edging, all of us are edging in that direction as we age. We're edging in that direction as our activity level declines or we choose not to exercise. We're heading in that direction because of diet. And diet just has changed. We live differently than we did 50 years ago when we didn't see these conditions of type 2 diabetes and pre-diabetes. Pre we also know that people who have elevated blood sugar level have a cluster of other symptoms that form a, a syndrome called metabolic syndrome. Anybody hear that before? metabolic syndrome. We can measure waist size, look at your blood lipid levels. Lipid is a word for fat, so we could see your cholesterol level, your level of circulating high density or HDL lipoproteins. So it's, it's a signal. So it, hopefully people are taking care of themselves and, and get this measurement. Now, this is not about when we talk about the product glucose balance. This is not about treating diabetes. This is about helping others manage their blood glucose at these touch points. That's what we're talking about. So let me, whoops, I just lasered somebody in the back. Sorry. I hope you're okay. I don't think it, it's laser treatment, yeah. Um, okay. So let's take a look at what are the leading factors. There are many. I think it is important to recognize that certain Certain genetics predispose you. And you should know that because, everyone should know that because you could be eating the same diet, doing the same amount of activity, living the same way as one of your best buddies, and you develop type 2 diabetes and they don't because you're predisposed. People of Hispanic descent, people of Native uh, American descent, in part, people of Asian descent, there are, are some considerations that put them at greater risk. But honestly, when we look at the statistics, everybody's heading in that direction. So it's not for one group to pay attention to and another to ignore. Do you think our diets have changed over the past 50 years? In so many ways that it's really, it's very difficult to describe it in a sentence, let alone 100 sentences how our diet has changed, refined foods, lack of probiotics in our diet. We used to really get more contact with our soil and with bacteria on and in our food. We just can't do that now. We're feeding billions of people, not just your neighborhood. So it's very, very different. And then activity level. 
We have so many things that make us be inactive. I know it's your phone's fault, your laptop's fault, your TV's fault, but there is some addictive quality to all those sedentary devices and our activity levels have greatly changed. Guess what? When you don't exercise, your cell receptor can't hear you, can't hear insulin knocking. It just doesn't listen very well. Insulin sensitivity is down in people who don't exercise. And this is getting a little bit even. So glucose imbalance is not simple in that I can't say, oh, well, it's because you're drinking soda. That's absolutely an incorrect statement. It's a big picture. It has to do with so many things. And same thing inside. Why is someone's blood sugar level edging in that direction? Why is it not doing what it used to be in a healthy range? Because all these different touch points are being impacted. So let's look at what the International Diabetes Federation looks to to help prevent the progression to insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. This is a message that's very important for you to know and to give to people. This is a big condition, the disease of type 2 diabetes that's impacting our, our world monetarily, health, quality of life. It can be reduced by almost 60% with some simple changes. And that is exercising 150 minutes a week. You probably thought I was going to say 150 minutes a day, and then you're going to forget that. So we're looking at 30 minutes, five days a week. Okay, this is moderate to vigorous activity, however you choose to do it, and make it fun, and maybe one other time I can talk about ways to do that, but it's it's really, as you know, once people start doing it, they feel really good and can't think of a day without exercise. Losing some body weight, if a person is overweight, in particular if they have abdominal body fat, shrinking fat cells, what do you think it does to insulin being heard at the level of the cell? Improves it. The receptor hears better, insulin's knock is firmer. It's just like, I'm here, I have glucose, I need to get in, I need to do my job. So that's important. And then the eating healthy. Whoa, there's two words <laughs> that, how do you tell somebody to eat healthy? When you look around and there's a void of healthful foods. And foods that may appear to be healthful, but they're devoid of many key nutrients because of refinement, because of we're feeding billions. So it's, this is the approach, though, and it's important that you know this. So let's look at the touch points. So here, again, I don't have Mr. Insulin, but what I want to show you at the bottom is there the intestinal tract. When you eat that bowl of quinoa or bread, the glucose has got to enter your body. Okay, it's got to enter your body. Glucose absorption rate is important, key. That's a touch point. Is it going in fast? Is it going in slow or medium? It really depends on what you eat in combination. We usually don't eat foods in isolation. If we eat a bar, like the Neolife bar, it's got a mix of different ingredients, whole food ingredients that actually lead to a slowed glucose absorption. This is something the Scientific Advisory Board has known about for a long time. So we're interested in slowing glucose uptake so it doesn't rise quickly. Because what do high levels of blood glucose do? Wreak havoc, and we don't want that, okay? Um, I had it on a previous frame and I failed to say something. And I don't want to flip back to make you dizzy. But when you go in and get your blood tested, sometimes they may tell you your A1C levels. Has anybody heard of that before? Okay, A1C is, is a measure of basically, have you had high blood glucose levels a lot recently? Has, have they spiked up? Because we can see it. Even though you're fasted, we can see that it's been spiked up and your hemoglobin has had glucose attached to it. We can check it out. So it's almost like the smoking gun. So you can't say, oh yeah, I've been eating really well, I've been having lots of fiber, and your physician says, ah, 
we have a high A1C. And if it's high, that's not good. That means you've had a lot of ups. A lot of ups, that's damaging. Okay, so that's what the A1C is. All right, so let's check out the pancreas. Um, whoops, whoops, sorry about that. The pancreas and the liver are touch points as well. I'm getting my buttons mixed up. They are touch points as well. The pancreas releases insulin. How well is that, is that going? And the liver is also a site of control. So there's a lot to be said. So in come Neal Life core nutrition products with glycemic response control technology. Follow the red line, which is what a lot of people select food, glucose levels go up, they fall back down, they eat again, it goes up, falls back down. We know the Neolife Shake has the glycemic response control technology, knowing, hey, we want to keep that in a narrow range. So the scientific advisory board, Neolife, has already had the insight to watch this. Very impressive, what I think. But let's take a look at furthering this complement to glucose management and in comes glucose balance. For healthy people, a unique formulation with herbal blend that we know well researched for purity, potency, and efficacy, along with two supporting nutrients to go to those touch points to glu glucose absorption, to what's going on at the liver, to what's happening at the pancreas. And when we knock on the door, how well is insulin working? How well is the receptor hearing? Those are items that are addressed in this product. So let's talk about the unique botanical blend. This is not from a shaker of cinnamon and from the turmeric I got out of my spice cabinet at all. These um, herbal products, cinnamon, curcumin from turmeric, and turmeric itself. And you can see that rich orange color if you've enjoyed, for example, Indian food before, uh, and hopefully not spilled it on your white pants or shirt. Um, it's just this beautiful color thanks to a lot of polyphenols with their vibrant pigment. These three botanical compounds are known and have been researched in healthy people as well as using diabetic models in rats and animals known to support healthy blood glucose levels. And what else do you think we want to help support? And this is a little bit, this is thinking onward. We want to help minimize the devastation when blood glucose levels do get high, the oxidation, the damage that occurs to blood vessel walls. <clears throat> so cinnamon has been researched and um, many studies, and I can certainly pass on some to people. I have my new business cards in the back. If anybody's <laughs> interested, I'm so thrilled. Um, anyway, just email and you can, I can send that on, on to you. We know that <clears throat> research studies show that, touch point, right? Let's slow the stomach emptying. That's going to slow glucose entry into the bloodstream. Important touch point. How about by slowing this absorption and potentiating the way insulin reacts with the receptor? Another touch point. So this is an important ingredient that's pure. We know that it works. We know cinnamon in this form is potent. This is not something that somebody can concoct on their own. This is a highly purified uh, product. And then for turmeric, this is the actual root that is added to the herbal blend. It has an array of polyphenols, curcuminoids, and of those many, many polyphenols, curcumin is the most potent. And additional curcumin is added to it for a total of 1,400 milligrams in a daily dose. So this is a well thought out product that's designed to help maintain blood sugar levels at those touch points. To look to ways to make sure insulin is released, to help minimize the destruction that glucose has by acting as an antioxidant. So this is really, I think, um, and I wasn't 
part of the SAB when this was created, when they came up with. And what I am amazed with always is the science. I go right to the science. Let me read the papers. They're very telling. So this curcumin that comes from turmeric, so turmeric's in it, then isolated out is the most potent of the polyphenols from turmeric, which also is added. So it's cinnamon, turmeric, and curcumin for 1,400 milligrams. And I'll share with you something about our testing in a little bit. Now, what's also important is these are protective in many different ways. We know that this combination of cinnamon, turmeric, and curcumin have anti-inflammatory. We're very interested in neuroprotective function because remember, elevated blood sugar levels can be that type 3 di diabetes that leads to Alzheimer's. What's going on in your brain? Oxidation, damage to blood vessels and to brain cells, neurons. So there are many powerful uh, impacts that this unique herbal blend has. So when we started and I said, yeah, diabetes isn't that good. It leads to a lot of damage in the body, healthcare costs. This is one of many conditions that is characterized by inflammation. Little fires that get started inside of cells, brain cells, muscle cells, organ cells, and you need to put those fires out. A healthful diet with support can calm those fires. Those are antioxidants. They're little fire extinguishers. Unfortunately, our diet has become devoid in those items, and we need to make those healthful food choices and to bring in these, these phytonutrients to help this process. It's important to know that these three herb, herbal from the cinnamon, the cinnamic acid, as well as turmeric as itself, as well as curcumin isolated from it, can have beneficial effects in lowering blood lipid levels. Okay, and measures of inflammation. We can go in and take a blood sample and see how inflamed you are. So these are all positive attributes. So this isn't just addressing one specific target. It's looking at your whole body, which is what we're about. So these supporting nutrients, in addition to the cinnamon, turmeric, and the curcumin, is the mineral chromium. This is a trace mineral. It's essential. In this product, it's isolated from yeast, the most potent form. Many people do not meet their needs for chromium. What, what do you guess why the reason is? Re refined diet, just very processed foods, it's low. And you need it to metabolize carbohydrate. Insulin needs this as a, it's a special factor that supports insulin function. To me, just a brilliant addition to this, um, to glucose balance. Then the compound alpha lipoic acid acts as an antioxidant, elevated blood glucose levels, all of this causes inflammation. We want to help support minimizing this damage and supporting healthy blood glucose levels. So five items, five items in glucose balance, but look at all the touch points in the body. So glucose management is, can be complex when we first look at it, but I hope we've narrowed it down so that you can see it. So we want to balance our blood glucose. We're interested in that because why? Why don't we want our blood? How would you tell somebody? You know, it's not great to have your blood glucose levels be elevated for prolonged periods of time because kidney damage. Kidney damage, it damages artery walls. If you said the glucose students start ripping off wallpaper, they might look at you strange. <laughs> But you can translate that into something that they, they would get or go ahead and use that example. So I think the glucose balance pro product is designed along with the core products to help support your, your um, glucose balance quite well. Now, yes, we're doing research. Clinical trial has been done. There's more to do. I just was sent from Dr. Clayton last night some preliminary results. And I'm smiling because they're very exciting, and we're looking at something that works in healthy people, okay, that supporting that whole glucose management setup. So that will take some time to describe and to put into a format that we can 
disseminate in an effective way. But I want you to know that, that we're behind it. So this is one of, to me, a very beautiful example of taking what nature has, the powerful ingredients, in potent forms, in pure forms, that work with the science behind it. It's what Neo Life stands for. So I'm very impressed with it, and I do hope that you find your balance as far as glucose is concerned.